Welcome to the third section of horticultural entomology. During the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the kinds of insects and mites that you find on ornamental plants, the kinds of plants we put in landscapes, like trees, shrubs, uh, flowering plants, as well as turf grass. And during the first week, the focus will be on those that are going to chew on the leaves and needles, defoliators. Uh, later we'll talk about uh, quite a lot of other different kinds of things that these insects can do. So, the first week, what we want to try to get through is to learn to recognize the kinds of insects that are found chewing leaves and needles of trees and shrubs. Also become familiar with the different patterns of injuries that may be associated with different kinds of insects, the way they feed. Some may feed on the edge of a leaf or skeletonize the leaf or shot hole the leaf. Some may produce webbing in the course of feeding. Be able to associate foliage feeding injuries with specific insect groups uh, as best as possible. Often these are quite specific and uh, we can diagnose problems sometimes based just on what kind of feeding we see on a plant with, even without the insect being present. And during the course of this I want you to consider, and we'll talk about this more, the relative severity to the plant of these kinds of injuries. Uh, different kinds of insects will feed at different times of year on different types of plants. And just how important is this to the health of a plant? So, to begin with, the defoliators generally involve members of three different insect orders. Uh, various caterpillars in the order Lepidoptera, things that will turn into a moth or butterfly. Uh, one group of beetles in particular, the leaf beetles. And then the odd group of wasps, uh, the sawflies, that feed on uh, foliage. To start with, in this first module, I, I want to talk about the caterpillars, but specifically the caterpillars that produce uh, conspicuous webs. Uh, now, all caterpillars can produce some silk if for no other reason than to surround a pupa in a cocoon, if it's a moth, uh, but uh, some make structures in the course of feeding, uh, either large tents at one extreme or maybe just tying a couple leaves together with some silk at the other. So the tent making caterpillars are represented by a couple of different species, but the most common are usually some kind of tent caterpillar. That is a term given to insects in the genus Malacosoma. Uh, we have five different tent caterpillars in this part of the world, uh, and four of them make conspicuous tents. They are all going to have complete metamorphosis. We're going to see some sort of egg mass uh, that will be glued onto twigs. Uh, we're going to have larvae that do the feeding. They will then pupate in a cocoon, mate, and then uh, produce an egg uh, mass on a, on a twig. One generation a year for all the tent caterpillars, and as we'll see it happens quite early in the season when the caterpillars are active. So the overwintering stage of tent caterpillars is a mass. It is a mass glued onto usually a twig. It might have several hundred eggs or couple hundred eggs and a kind of frothy material covers it to some extent. These are eggs that will be the wintering stage. This is how they get through the winter and the eggs will hatch sometime in spring, usually just about coincident with bud break, very early in the year. As they come out of the egg mass, uh, they will start constructing a tent immediately and the, they will feed and, and work together as a group or at least uh, work together as a group to make the tent later they will spread out uh, in terms of feeding. The tent is uh, dense silk. Uh, it is constructed in the crotch of a twig or sometimes a larger branch. Uh, may it be quite small in the very beginning and not easily observed, but as they get bigger they will expand the size of a tent and increasingly it becomes more visible. The tent of a tent caterpillar is used for them to rest during the day, either in it or on it. This is where they'll shed their skins. As you can see, they, they defecate sometimes quite a bit here as well. But it's kind of like a bivouac, a, a daytime bivouac, a shelter. Uh, and then at nighttime, they will forage and generally feed throughout the, the canopy of the plant. So most feeding occurs at night, at the end of their a life stage you might see them feeding in the daytime as well but mostly they're feeding at night and resting sheltered on the tent during the day. Now when all this happens is quite early in the year. Uh, 
the eggs are an overwintered stage and they will hatch very shortly after bud break. So not too long after that we'll start to see evidence of tent caterpillar activity. And in this picture I'm showing uh, one known as the southwestern tent caterpillar associated with poplars and cottonwoods down in uh, western Colorado in particular in this part of the state or in this, in this state. Um, and these pictures were taken on May 5th in, near Gateway which is near the Utah border. And as you can see the insect has already essentially done what it's going to do for the year. Uh, the defoliation episode for the year is, is over. Uh, so most of the feeding was actually occurring in April. Once a tent caterpillar has finished feeding, usually they will wander away from that tree or shrub on which they were feeding and pupate somewhere else on nearby vegetation or in the picture on the, the right is underneath a bridge. Uh, these are a kind of caterpillar that does produce a cocoon, quite a conspicuous cocoon of silk. And uh, uh, after they have spun the silk and cocoon around them, they will pupate. And a few weeks later, they will emerge as an adult form. And, and most tent caterpillars have adults that look somewhat like this. Uh, they're kind of heavy-bodied moths uh, flying at night. The males will have much longer antennae than the females. Uh, and uh, they will mate and the female will then move to a host plant and glue a mass of eggs onto the twig. And that is the overwintering stage. Now, I said tent caterpillars uh, usually make tents, but we actually have an oddball tent caterpillar, and it's not an insignificant species, the forest tent caterpillar. It is in this genus, Malacosoma dystria forest tent caterpillar is unusual in that it does not make a tent for uh, a, a, a permanent bivouac. Uh, so even though it has the name tent caterpillar, it doesn't make a permanent tent. This is sometimes the most common tent caterpillar we have in particularly forest settings, uh, most often associated with aspen. It is a distinctive caterpillar uh, in that it has a kind of unusual blue color to it as well as little keyhole patterns on the back. And again, the eggs are the overwintering stage laid in a mass on, on the twigs of a host plant. Again, aspen is a common host, but it can be on many different kinds of plants. Instead of a permanent tent, what they will do is they'll make temporary mats of silk. So you might see the forest and caterpillar resting as a mass on a trunk or on a large limb and underneath them is, is some silk that they've produced. Uh, they may use that for a couple of days, then move on and, and make a different resting platform in a different part of the tree uh, later. So no permanent tent, but a series of silken mats that they will rest on during the day. And consistent with the other tent caterpillars, they are primarily feeding at night. Now, things get a little confusing when we talk about tent caterpillars because often the most common caterpillar that makes a tent that people see is not a tent caterpillar. It's instead a different insect called the fall webworm. Now the fall webworm is going to make a big loose tent and you're going to see it more in July, August, maybe sometimes even in September. A lot of trees get affected. Poplars, cottonwoods, uh, elm, choke cherry, just to name a few. This has a different life history. It is going to winter in the pupal stage and then later in, in spring it will emerge as an adult and the adults are a very attractive white moth that flies at night. Uh, after mating the adults, uh, uh, the adult female will move to leaves of, of whatever plant she chooses to lay her eggs on and she'll lay them in the form of a mass on the leaves. So this is happening a little later. This might be happening in June maybe even happening in July when the egg masses are being laid. So the occurrence of this is shifted several uh, months usually from when we're going to see the activity of a, a tent caterpillar. Eggs hatch, uh, they are in a mass and the young caterpillars originally are together as a group, a feeding group. They'll do a little bit of skeletonizing right in place on that leaf around the area where the eggs hatched. Uh, and they'll start to produce silk. Uh, produce silk that covers the first leaf and maybe another leaf. 
And as they get bigger, they uh, produce silk that progressively encompasses uh, larger areas of the, of the plant. So here would be the eggs of the fall, fall webworm, egg mass, 100, 200 eggs. And it hatches, and as they grow, they are going to web over more and more leaves. And so they, they uh, kind of cover the food on which they're going to feed, uh, and then feed always within this large, loose, ever-expanding tent. The tents can be quite large and quite conspicuous uh, as they do cover a, a quite a large area and they're not just restricted to the crotch of a, of a tree as would a tent caterpillar. The uh, tents are also uh, become uh, conspicuous because they're mixed with little pieces of leaf fragments um, that they've chewed and, and uh, have dropped into the silk and tent uh, as well as some fecal droppings, some old skins, uh, become dark not all that attractive uh, and uh, again quite quite conspicuous big uh, big loose tents and sometimes you may have uh, dozens of them in a single tree these old tents uh, uh, can very visibly persist through the winter too so in, in the picture on the right we're seeing uh, some old tents that were taken in spring in Grand Junction uh, again still looking pretty pretty conspicuous there on the, on the right I do want to say one thing about this is sometimes these tents are, are being referred to as being caused by bagworms. And these are not bagworms. Uh, the term bagworm is given to another group of, of insects, caterpillars as well, but caterpillars that create a bag around their body. So in each individual caterpillar has a bag around their body. Bagworms are extremely uh, uncommon in this part of the world, but they're not uncommon. If you get a little further to the east or a little further to the south, uh, there's some uh, common bagworm that uh, does well in areas where it doesn't get quite as cool during the winter and not as dry. So we have two primary groups of insects that make a big conspicuous tent. One is a tent caterpillar and the other is a fall webworm. And, and the two things to remember on how to separate these two out is tent caterpillars are going to have their tent construction period uh, early in the season and the fall webworm is more of a uh, early summer summer kind of uh, insect often we may actually also have two generations of fall webworm whereas there's only one for the tent caterpillar and the type of tent in terms of how it's constructed is very different uh, the fall webworm uh, makes a big loose tent that is covering over the foliage and then they'll feed within that tent whereas the function of the tent for a tent caterpillar is more of a, a resting site is a resting platform it's much more densely constructed of silk uh, and it's in a crotch of the plant of the tree uh, uh, and then they work off from there uh, feeding uh, throughout the crown of the tree but they don't cover the, the areas in which they feed with this tent now, to a lesser extent, uh, silken structures are produced by some other caterpillars. Uh, they may, these, these would not be as big, and sometimes they're, they're quite small. But uh, the kinds of insects that might also produce uh, silk uh, might be referred to as a webworm, fall webworm, we've already seen that, or a leaf roller, or a leaf tire. Uh, the, the, the webworms are ones that often will produce um, a fairly large tent. Uh, multiple uh, uh, individuals will be feeding together, uh, tying together several leaves. Uh, so you'll have a smallish tent, uh, not as big as we see with the fall webworm, but, but uh, again, a conspicuous tent. A very common uh, webworm in, in much of the United States, it's only been found uh, once here in Colorado near Canyon City, is the mimosa webworm very common insect in some areas that develop in thornless honey locust and, and mimosa. Now the leaf rollers are, are going to be caterpillars that use silk in terms of uh, constructing a structure within which they feed, but they do it individually. So they'll just curl a leaf over and tie it up uh, and feed within. So uh, the fruit tree leaf roller is a very common species on a lot of trees and shrubs. The large aspen tortrix is the leaf roller of aspen. 
So here we can see the kind of injury we might see from a fruit tree leaf roller. Uh, fruit trees are one of the more common uh, kinds of plants that they do affect. What you would see is just a little bit of curled leaf. The uh, leaves have been tied together uh, and if you get it at the right stage you'll see the little caterpillar in there. Now these leaf rollers are heavily parasitized so oftentimes they, they're killed. Uh, there might be a parasite that's within that. And uh, one caution is, is one other thing that sometimes ties together leaves that uh, could be confused with a, a leaf roller. Sometimes spiders do that. They'll, they'll tie together a leaf and uh, create a little egg mass with, within it. But if it's early in the season and you're seeing some associated kind of chewing injury, uh, then leaf rollers are, are very likely the culprit. Now, those are caterpillars that produce uh, some sort of silk, silken structure uh, as they feed. Most caterpillars do not produce visible webbing as they feed, and, and that's going to be the subject of the next group of insects that we're going to talk about.